Next up is Ed Ward. And uh, a lot of you know Ed. He's, what do I say, Ed? I'm a grandfather. He's a grandfather. <laughs> Several times? Four? 15 times? 18 times. 18 grandchildren. 80, 80 grandchildren? Anyway, Ed Ward is a Denver poet and uh, a beat and a lot of connections wow. with the uh, Venice Beats and uh, a lot of things that happened in Denver post the glory days of the Beats. And uh, Ed's going to uh, do one of his pieces tonight and uh, accompanied by his Baldine on guitar. We're going to need this microphone. And they're going to need this microphone, so I'll leave it to them. House in 1959, where he finally found his path. Venice West was the heart and soul of the beat movement in Southern California. In the almost deserted beach town that LA had abandoned, you could share a $40 a month pad for five or ten people with whom you might not or you might or might not ever cross paths. Frankie eventually fell in with Stuart Kirkhoff and Tony Stabella. And when Life Magazine came looking for Pete Nicks, they were looking for Frankie, Tony, and Stuart, who came to be known as We Three Called Venice. Every day they hung out, walking the boardwalk, getting high and writing and making art. Larry Lipton wrote a book about them called The Holy Barbarians. And then Frankie, Tony, and Stuart spent the rest of their lives attempting to hide trying to be anonymous because their lives were not about fame but their lives were really about love and art community and family about inspiration about being vessels for the higher consciousness that is inspiration all three made art every day of their lives usually sitting around the kitchen table or in a bookstore Frankie and Stewart spent a lot of time incarcerated at Terminal Island for drug offenses, home at times to the disparate likes of Al Capone and Timothy Leary. And they spent years, years walking the yard, watching each other's backs, and talking poetry, and the muse, i.e. the lady. 
Frankie went on to write 11 books of poetry, as well as producing a coffee table book of poetry and collages. See, Frankie was consumed with ritual. He made an offering to the lady by burning a poem that he would never read again at the start of every poetry reading. Because Frankie, Tony, and Stewart helped spark the Southern California art scene, the city of Los Angeles eventually erected three beach sculptures on the Venice Beach, sporting famous lines from poems they had written. Frankie's little lines were, I am a man who stands against the mountain and thinks of pebbles. Because some of the Venice West artists, Jimmy Ryan Morris, Saul White, Tony Sabella, wound up at different times here in Denver. Frankie, too, found himself living in Denver, off and on, in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. His work was featured in Denver's premier literary newspaper, The Mile High and Underground, and in many of Larry Lake's Bowery publications. When Frankie died last August, on August 20th, 2018, the world of words lost a man who, as he liked to say, I invented black. The space that is the heavens between the stars. Marsha and I drove to LA for Frankie's memorial in September, and I prepared the eulogy of, short, of sorts to share with friends. Frankie was famous for being a poet, an artist, a drugstore cowboy, and the last 25 years for being a rock star in the Los Angeles world of Narcotics Anonymous. My eulogy, however, touches on the side of Frankie that could easily be overlooked. Eulogy for Frankie, Mr. Frank T. Rios. As we all are, Frankie was many things. Dare I say teens? Poet, husband, artist, father, grandfather, drugstore cowboy, friend, and sponsor. But I'd like to add something to that list that was mentioned at his funeral. Something that reflects my relationship with Frankie. And that is prankster. Who would have thought? I met Frankie in 1979, the inaugural year of the James Ryan Morris Foundation presentation of the Colorado Arts Awards, the Tombstones, a means of artists honoring other artists. Frankie was in from L.A., along with the Den Denver Venice Beach Connected Contingency. Tony Sabella, Gail Davis, Marsha Getzler, Fred Mason, Bill Daly, Saul Michelle White. Larry Lake had asked me to have Frankie stay with me and Marsha at my house, as Frankie was to receive the first Tombstone Award for Poetry. Well, I had read all of Frankie's published works, and I loved it. I also learned that how he fit into the Venice West Denver poetry world, and I felt it a great honor to have him stay at my house. Right off, we found some common ground aside from poetry. Our East Coast sensibilities and accents, for one. Okay, I didn't say tree, when counting to five, or when numbering the muses, but our cadence and rhythms were the same. We ran around Denver and chilled in my backyard for a few days, before heading to the Mermaid Cafe in Central City for the awards ceremony. Bob Gray received the tombstone for music, Stan Brackage for film, and Angelo de Benedetto received it for art and sculpture. And then Larry Lake, the instigator behind the awards, took the stage to introduce the presenter of an award for poetry, Mr. Frank T. Rios. I'm sitting in the back of the cafe thinking, what the fuck, figuring that Larry had to have had a wee bit too much of something or another, as Frankie's supposed to give, not present the award, get, not present the award. And then Frankie alley cats his way to the stage and announces the recipient of the Colorado Arts Award for Poetry. Ed Ward. Holy shit. Larry and Frankie have completely pranked me. I have never been so bowly baffled. Whereas Stan and Angela and Bob had all given sweet, inspirational acceptance speeches, I, the poet, was utterly speechless. I think I'm all damn, or no fucking way here. Four days with Frankie and the alley cat never let the cat out of the bag. Fast forward a couple of years and Marsha and I leave Denver, looking for a better city to live in, but we return. 
We run half of a duplex on Delaware Street, and by month's end, the talented painter from LA, Joey Patton, moves into the other half of the duplex to the south. And Frankie Rios and Larry Lake, they move to the place just north of us. We had our own little bohemian enclave, and I feel we did some of our best work that year. Fast forward a few more years, and I'm in LA with Frankie and Larry visiting Baza Alexander, the founder of the beatnik quasi-religious Temple of Man, wherein I am an ordained minister, shortly before Baza's passing. We're talking weddings and ceremonies, and that ministerial state of consciousness one enters into to make such events true human rituals. And Frankie hits me to the first step in getting there. The process of dressing for the day. The selection, cleaning, nitpicking, and preparation of the clothing for the ceremony. I've done close to a thousand weddings. And I begin each one thinking of Frankie as I polish my boots, roll the cat hair from my pants, adjust my belt and bolo, sort and put on my clothes to become the minister I need to be. Frankie had called it putting on the robes. Fast forward a few more years. Larry's gone, Oz is gone, Bill Daly's gone, Tony's gone. And Frankie calls me from LA with a request. Eddie, would you publish my next little book? As I had published Tony's Kid in America a year before. And now Frankie's asking me to do the same for him. Well, at the time I had a lot on my plate, and even more on the pipeline. And I don't publish books. I don't write a check and pay someone to make them. I craft them by hand. I one finger hunt and peck, type them, edit them, typeset them and design them. I collate them and perfect bind them with paintbrush glue and a homemade book press. Glue them into covers I score with a butter knife, all one at a time. Finally, I draw you across town to trim them with a friend of mine's 150-year-old gargantuan paper cutter. Tony's death had made me realize that I'd better get busy taking care of my own shit. And sadly, it passed on Frankie's request, telling him, no nah, man, I just don't have the time or the inclination right now. I knew I disappointed Frankie, and I could hear the bafflement in his voice as we concluded our conversation. <sighs> yeah. Finally, fast forward to 2010, and the 50th anniversary of the Temple of Man. Marcia and I are in Venice for the Temple of Man parade from Caprio to the beach, which stops at the sculpted in stone poems of Frankie, Stewart, and Tony. Everyone's beat nicked and hippied out, meandering and parading when Frankie appears. He comes running up to me, and I'm not sure what he's going to say, and he hands me the Temple of Man flag and suggests, Eddie, go on, man. You lead the parade. The perfect Charlie Chaplin gesture. His way of letting me know I was forgiven and of reminding me. We're good, man. No hard feelings. Brothers we were, and brothers we are. 